three hours, okay? Just stay here. Don't do anything dumb. Okay, I know that I promised to cover The Flash next, because I got some things to say about that. But that was before Sony's beloved Madam Web had unleashed its full glory onto me, and it was just too good of a movie to pass up covering. So the Mad Goose Wizard spectacle will have to wait. The Mad Goose Wizard? Madam Web is supposed to be a film that reflects back to the old days of the superhero genre. And in a sense, it does do that by not being a bad movie based on the ham-fisted messaging and divisive content, but by simply being a good old-fashioned outright bad movie. Name any area, any department within the making of this film, and I can guarantee that it falls flat and is not up to the standard it should have been. I decided that today we wouldn't just look at the storytelling itself, which is what I usually do in these kind of videos, but instead go through every major aspect of this film. So let's go through them as we take Madam Webb's wisdom of how not to make a movie. Let's start from the basic face value visuals, every frame we watch and every sound we hear on the screen. All I can really give this film is that it's shot competently, I guess. Everything seems to work decently within the realms of cinematography, shot composition, blocking, rule of thirds, and all of that. But the main problem with the visual style of this film is that it doesn't fit the atmosphere of a story taking place back in 2003. Although, of course, this can come down to being a very subjective argument, I myself find this really distracting at times. It can feel too modern, too similar to other recent movies like it. I'm not saying that every shot or sequence feels like this, or that it completely degrades the movie, but it's definitely something worth taking into consideration. But throughout the movie, we often get these really stylized shots, and how clean the setting looks, and the movement of the camera, what's in the frame. For example, take this shot early on in the movie. In a smooth push-in shot, Ezekiel is walking in this very tall and extravagant section of the building. The dark lighting and soft colors give it a very futuristic and almost utopian-like look and feel. Now, with the whole premise of this movie being about seeing into the future and how our characters connect with it, it is possible that this is an intentional creative style to showcase this. After all, this is just right before the scene of Ezekiel's vision from the future. But again, keep in mind that this film takes place in a less advanced 2003, and this whole sequence of shots doesn't really showcase that aesthetic at all. On another quick note, that also goes for things in the frame as well. Like, why is there this entire high-tech, like, nine-monitor setup that this random person knows how to operate in 2003? I get that the villain stole all this tech from high organizations and all that, but once you introduce tech that can take a visual image of someone's dream and de-age them by 10 years, that's a pretty far stretch, don't you think? Now this isn't me saying that it has to feel like a movie that came out around that time, but there should be some definitive reason for why your film takes place in the time period it does, and you should try to convey that time period in interesting and creative ways. Now on the opposite end of the spectrum, look at Christopher Nolan's latest film Oppenheimer, a three hour biopic set around the 1940s in World War II. And it too is shot very well for a film today, but there are so many other things Nolan and his cinematographer do visual wise. We see these very unstable and tense close-up shots of fission, the electrons, the atomic blast, warped and distorted lights across the screen to visualize Robert Oppenheimer's life and perspective. One from an ambitious physicist. And in the scene when we learn the bomb has officially been dropped, no one pulls all kinds of tricks and creative decisions. You notice that the background, just out of focus, begins to fizzle and vibrate. One could interpret it as the vibration of atoms in a solid, which would be how Oppenheimer sees the world through his own lens different from everyone else. Or you could see it as the unstableness of this whole ordeal in the film, where the scientists and physicists are dealing into incredibly dangerous power that could destroy the world, and now with the confirmation of the news about the bomb, that power is being unleashed. We get these bright cuts and flashes of a blinding white light, referencing back to the visual blinding impact of the Trinity test earlier in the film, and now Hiroshima that has just been bombed. At a certain point, the audio and dialogue cuts, and we are met with complete and total silence spliced with Robert's speech and other sounds. After the speech, the crowd gives a visual eruption of applause. We follow Robert with a close-up of his face as he walks from the podium into the crowd. Now you'll notice the shot is going in and out of focus. It's distinctly handheld and shaky, depicting the feeling of the whole situation. And we finally see something on the floor, the burned and charred body of a Japanese woman taken by the bomb. It elevates the reality of what's just been done. It's a very stylized film, and obviously these kinds of decisions should all depend on how it adds to the story. Ah, man, I can't believe I talked so much about Oppenheimer and Madam Web video. Ugh. Anyway, jumping back to Madam Web, 
The visual style should come with a purpose, but for Madame Web, nothing particularly stands out. Let's look at a scene that uses some similar artistic choices. After Cassandra gets the girls from the diner, she goes back and we get this confrontational scene with Ezekiel. With her visions becoming more prominent, the scene ultimately becomes a collage of a conversation with a bunch of sliced footage on top of it. Ezekiel frequently cuts back and forth to his costume form, Quick inserts of different loud sounds emphasize the sudden cuts. To give this scene credit, it is using the concept of foresight and its advantage and technically gives the style of this scene a purpose. Although it feels like a sudden exposition dump for our protagonist, the cuts and jumps and bursts of light are so frequent and random within the scene that they feel so overdone and exhausting to watch. If anything, it distracts from the scene and simultaneously makes it look and feel much more immature and cheap than it should. It's mostly comprised of these really fast cuts and choppy editing, which brings us to our next section. We've pretty much already covered the gist of it, but here it is. This movie doesn't have the worst editing of a movie I've ever seen, which is a pretty low bar as we all know, but it's certainly not the best either. The movie tries to use these fast and intense cuts and these weird snap zooms to give a sense of importance and urgency to the situation. But this feels more like a cheap and lazy tactic to try and stitch these shots together. Like look at this moment when Cassandra's doing CPR and then from her visions we're suddenly cutting back and forth to it being a different person entirely. One moment Cassandra's hands are covered in blood, the next they're not, and then we go through the entire replay of the scene, and like, why? At the scene's end, we learn it was all a setup as we are seeing into the future that this guy's about to die, and guess what? Like with the diner scene we just talked about, it's usually these moments of her strange visions that feel so overdone and unnecessarily long, it can become jarring to watch. So key takeaway, don't make movies that are hard to watch. So generally, when you have a tight main cast of characters, you want to make sure they can act and have good chemistry on screen. Now, you obviously shouldn't rely on the actors to make a great scene, you need to give them material to work with, but your actors should hopefully be able to put in a good performance through their character and have good chemistry. And to Madame Webb, I say, Ugh. as someone who's tried acting myself, let me just put as bluntly as I can that it is probably pretty difficult to act when you've got nothing to act from, or at least nothing very good. I mean, look at my guy Ezekiel, he's trying his best to be the silent but menacing villain, a killer trying to hunt his prey, but he can only do so much, right? It's just not that intimidating. And even our main ensemble of characters felt really dull, one-dimensional, yeah, I'm going that far, and just boring. I mean, just take a look at this scene where Cassandra is going to drop these kids off with their parents and then, you know, skedaddle. These three girls take turns giving us their quick sob story in pretty much the most dull and mundane tone possible. Like, even they're not interested in what they're saying. And also keep in mind that this is the second time we've gotten this conversation. This time we're just presenting more information. But it's essentially just the exact same thing. But I digress. I think from here on the problem lies with the characters themselves, which brings us to... These characters aren't very imaginative or entertaining on their own, and really only have a few distinct traits or backstory we even know about. Julia is the typical shy, introverted dork, Maddie is the free-spirited, rebellious teenager, and Anya is... wait, what was her thing again? Like, I literally can't remember a thing about her. I guess she might get deported, however that works. Cool character. Uh. Now Cassandra, on the other hand, is a whole character study and not in the way you want your characters to be. Cassandra Webb is a very awkward and antisocial person. She doesn't know how to accept a kid's drawing, she avoids getting out of her comfort zone at all costs. A bit strange for this kind of person to become an EMT when, you know, whose job it is to deal with people in crisis. And her backstory not only isn't compelling or emotional, but it doesn't make a lick of sense either. Apparently, Cassie has this deep internal torment about how her mother hated her, or something of that nature, and it, it just completely comes out of nowhere. The quote-unquote setup of this is that early on in the film, we see Cassie's mother pregnant with her, but isn't letting her stop her research. And then Ezekiel betrays her, and she ends up dying just after giving birth to Cassie. But this raises a whole lot of questions that are never answered, like, how did Cassie get back to New York? Don't know. Why didn't the spider tribe take her in as their own? I mean, she literally has powers like they do. What? Don't know. And how did she get a hold of her mother's research? Who did she get them from? And has she never taken this close of a look at it until now? Don't know. The quote unquote payoff is when Cassie revisits the Amazon tour she was born and everything is revealed to her. 
She learns that her mom was searching for the spiders to save Cassie, which would be fine, but Cassie's beliefs uh, make so little sense. It's like her core characteristic is this one aspect of her life. Don't get me wrong, it should be a crucial part of her character and her life and her backstory, but how can you enjoy a character whose response to every other thing sounds like this? My mom, she died. My mom died. My mom. Quite the delivery. Like the others, she just doesn't feel like a real character. But even as a teen, these characters don't get much better. Now, one thing I'm willing to give this movie props for is that it wants and at least tried to tie in the whole backstory about Cassie growing up without a mother to similar situations that these three girls are in, and Cassie's arc ultimately being that she chooses to be the mother that they never had. Not a bad theme at all, just pretty corny execution. I mean, can we even call this a character arc? All that really happens is that Cassie slowly becomes less agitated around them, and for whatever reasons decides to help them. Like, does Cassie's being an EMT have any effect on why she helps these girls? Why doesn't this movie emphasize on the emotional and personal connection with Ezekiel being the one who murdered her mother? What a missed opportunity. What are the internal thoughts of the girls who have just been swept up and are on the run? Do they really trust Cassie? Do they trust each other? And it's not like we're gonna get answers to any of these questions anyways, so just don't think about it, I guess. Which brings us to the core of the issue, I think, the story itself. poorly written script with little exploration into its world and what it has to say, and the absolute waste of such a concept. I mean, being able to see into the future opens up a whole world of exploration and stories, but at times the movie shrugs it off as some weird uncontrollable disease, and at other times it's a simple tool Cassie uses, like moving a body part, it's just so natural and common that you know, there's, there's no need to question it. It baffled me how quickly and to the extent superhero movies have taken the interest and insight out of their own superpowers. And what's even worse is that this is an origin story for Adam Webb and her powers. Remember Sam Raimi's first Spider-Man film? Peter Parker starts out as an average, actually below average, bullied high schooler. But once he actually gets his powers, it's not like we just push all that exploration to the side and gloss over it. We spend a good majority of time on the inciting incident. We watch Peter slowly learn that he can climb walls, leap across rooftops, and shoot webs, organic spider webs. But this part of the story doesn't exist in a vacuum either, which is what I love about it and makes it so great. What makes the death of Uncle Ben in the film so powerful is that it connects to Peter and his newfound powers. He could have stopped that guy. He had the ability, but out of his own frustration and grudge, he didn't. It's at this moment when the line from earlier comes full circle. Remember, with great power comes great responsibility. And thus sets up Peter's change from an ordinary teenager into Spider-Man. It's an entire exploration into how these powers quite literally changed his entire life, for better and worse. And I miss when we got that. But now what do we get? Character gets superpowers and right out of the gate we're in a flurry of ugly, muddled, gloomy visuals of these powers. And what, we the audience are just supposed to be cool with it? These characters are just cool with it? Are you special? Imagine having the ability to see into the future, whether you can control it or not. The effects that could have on someone would be drastic. Their whole life and world would change. Isn't that the story this concept should be used to tell? To watch our hero's world completely flip upside down and explore it with them? Obviously I'm very biased when it comes to this, but I find this repetitive story structure of fast-paced origin, big CGI finale battle to be incredibly tiring and boring. It's like playing toys with your sibling and you end up just trying to one-up each other with what your guy can do. Pretty soon it gets to the point where all of your attacks are deflected and their guy is just completely invincible. They can't die and they can't lose. And what happens? All the weight of the situation is gone. No stakes, no tension, no fun, nothing. Now after everything I've said, maybe I don't want to be too harshly on Madam Web specifically for this problem, since this is a problem shared equally among dozens of other movies just like it, even outside of superhero films and the MCU and the Sonyverse in general. But this is what happens with a lack of care to actually explore your story and characters. It becomes dull and numb to watch play out. Suddenly everyone can just do anything and it's totally fine, no questions asked. Before we're done, I want to talk about one last important part of making a movie that you need to get right. The marketing. The obvious question you need to ask yourself is, 
How do I market my product, in this case my film, so that people actually want to see it? How do I garner interest and popularity? Like the vast majority of big budgeted sequels and franchise films these days, Sony decided to go the easy route and pull all the tricks in the books, and it shows in its trailers and marketing. These shots in the trailer of the Spider Girls are exactly what you get in the film. Nothing more, nothing less, they're nothing but an attempt to give us a taste of nostalgia and excitement. And the overuse of this tactic is definitely what killed the marketing of popular IPs turned into film. It's not enough to trust the marketing anymore, so now most people don't. Fortunately, it seems to be a dying strategy that no longer guarantees butts and seats. Which means that studios will actually have to try for a change. And while we're talking about marketing in general, Hollywood, please stop showing the entire movie in a three minute trailer. Good golly. Once you've seen it, you've basically already seen the whole movie. It's so annoying and destroys any investment to actually check out the film. So guys, here are some pretty simple rules to follow when marketing your film. One. Don't give away your entire dang movie in the trailer. 2. Don't emptily tease on nostalgia alone to hype the movie. Your audience will see through it, as they have. 3. Don't give away anything that will severely hurt the movie's performance, like awkwardly written lines, cringy delivery, bad dubbing, bad and cheap looking CGI and visual effects, divisive and controversial ideas, which might be the one thing this movie's marketing got right. And expanding on that last point, don't insult your audience. They're not dumb. Don't push your customer base away. No bait and switch, no remade for modern audiences. Give them what they came for and more. Ah, it's crazy. It seems so simple in theory and practice, but by sheer incompetence, it seems that Hollywood just hasn't relearned how to make good movies. It's like rocket science or something. It's just so confusing and complicated, you see. Because in 2024's Hollywood, Madam Web is the new standard for filmmaking, and it was only a matter of time before we got here. So take these words of wisdom from Madam Web's failure, this is how to not make movies. Thank you for watching, this took a lot of time to put together, but I tried my hardest and quickest to get it all out to you. If you like what you heard, consider checking out some of my other movie critiques right here. And remember, it's webbing time.